The last of my three talks uh, will be somewhat different than the previous two, rather more idiosyncratic. Uh, the subject uh, that Benoit asked me to talk about were those parasitic effects in nonlinear processes. Uh, let me illustrate by an anecdote or two uh, what I mean to try to answer or at least point out the kind of questions that one should ask about this, uh, this subject. I put up this slide in my uh, first talk, and all it showed was the nonlinear coefficient and the transparency range for several conventional biofringently phase match crystals, as well as several quasi phase match crystals. After the talk, uh, Professor Boyd, author of the standard text on nonlinear optics, had looked at this chart and he asked me, why does anyone ever use KTP rather than piplin? Uh, lithium nibate's got a larger nonlinear coefficient and a wider transparency range, so what's the point of KTP? Well, uh, if only it were that simple. We'll have to see. Uh, um, another chart one might look at is one of the uh, figure of merit for uh, nonlinear interactions. And uh, uh, if you look at this figure of merit of several materials, lithium borate, barium borate, lithium nibate, compared to KTP, normalize the KTP rather, you would find, wow, lithium nibate's great stuff. Uh, uh, and yet if you look in practical technology, this is almost the inverse order in which these materials are typically used. Certainly, lithium borate sees far more use than lithium niobate in, in real nonlinear devices, though, of course, lithium niobate has its place. But you might guess that this is not quite the right figure of merit. And in fact, uh, um, Majid Ebrahimzadeh, in his lecture, he pointed out an irony of nonlinear optics. He said, uh, the lowest nonlinearity material is often the most widely used one, fused silica. Great nonlinear material, smallest nonlinear coefficient. So maybe there's something wrong with that figure of merit as the way to judge what material is best for a general application. So maybe we want to take a look at that. Um, another question, or sorry, another slide I showed was this one where uh, I discussed these kind of issues with respect to the use of nonlinear materials in uh, various kinds of devices. And I said, well, there's all these other issues that might become important, but I would save a discussion of them for the last lecture because they're rather more complex and difficult to quantify in many cases. But among the quantities that are relevant to the utility of a crystal are its uh, uh, attenuation coefficient, the scatter and absorption, perhaps both the linear and the nonlinear version of these properties, uh, the uh, surface and volume damage resistance to high peak intensity uh, radiation, uh, some of its thermal properties, what is its uh, uh, thermal coefficient of, re of refraction, the thermal optic coefficient, what is its thermal conductivity. You might say, why should I care about the thermal conductivity of an optical crystal? I'm not going to make a frying pan out of it. I'm going to use it to make nonlinear mixing processes. But it turns out this can matter. Um, various technical issues. You can have the most wonderful properties in the world in a cubic millimeter crystal. But if you can't find a crystal grower talented enough to make it into a macroscopic crystal, odds are it will never find a use beyond publishing FizRev letters. Um, uh, you would like this crystal to be environmentally stable. If I leave it out on a damp summer day in New Jersey, does it deliquesce into a pile of uh, uh, liquid? You don't want that, usually. Um, uh, and then there are some nebulously think, uh, describable aging phenomena. If I come back after I've run this crystal for a day or a week or a month, are its properties the same? Or has something changed? Has its refractive index changed? Has its absorption changed? Uh, there are photo-induced phenomena, known as photorefraction and photochromism, where under intense illumination, in fact, the refractive index and the absorption coefficient of many of these materials do change, and often change in ways that make them far less useful for the nonlinear optical application that you were considering. So 
we need to take at least a bit of a look at how some of this enters into uh, the behavior of, of real nonlinear materials. Uh, as I promised, this is now Friday morning, I think, so I'll talk a little about these. Um, another way to take a look at uh, these properties is, one, uh, uh, to decide for a particular class of applications which of those rather long list of properties do I actually care about. For example, if I want to uh, create the second harmonic of a one joule, 100 picosecond pulse, I'm probably going to worry a lot about the surface damage threshold of the material I'm using. Uh, you don't want to blow the face off the crystal, so the lower the surface damage threshold, the larger a crystal I might need to accommodate high peak power radiation. Uh, for high average power applications, uh, I often would worry a lot about thermal properties. As we'll discuss, if you put a high average power beam through a, a crystal and there is some absorption, and there's always some absorption, uh, then uh, the heat deposited in the crystal will raise the temperature in the vicinity of the beam and how much that temperature rises will depend on the thermal conductivity of the material. That's where that sneaks into our concerns. And the response of the material to that temperature rise, the change in its refractive index, perhaps its thermal expansion coefficient, and certainly the thermal acceptance bandwidth of the phase matching process to which you're placed, you, in which these, the crystal is being used, will all enter into how much you care about the temperature rise controlled by those uh, uh, properties of the crystal. Uh, if you want to do more than a very quick demonstration of some phenomenon, as I said, these slow uh, aging effects, uh, slow changes in the properties of the crystal are going to matter a lot to you. If you're just going to look, I showed this spatial soliton formed. I took a picture. It's 10 seconds later. I'm done with that measurement. All right, maybe I'll worry a little bit less about those long-term properties long-term stability about the material. And finally, uh, if you really want to use this reproducibly, and especially if you're Majid and you want to put it into one of your commercial OPOs, ideally the growth and fabrication technology of that crystal are reasonably mature, so you can go to a vendor and get 10 pieces or 100 pieces, and they will all be more or less the same, so that you don't have to individually adjust each device you build to the specific characteristics of the crystal number seven, which is different from crystal number nine, which is a very tedious thing to do in any reproducible kind of application. Uh, uh, two points to make about that list. One, if you meet nine out of 10 of these requirements, but you fail, or the crystal fails on the 10th, well, it may not work for your application. That is, it's kind of a weakest link argument. If the surface blows off the crystal every time you try to use it, even if everything else is great, it's no good for your application. And an important point, and one of the reasons why these questions are rarely easy to answer uh, in detail or even in general, is that the key properties that matter, the surface damage threshold, the absorption coefficient, these photochromic and photorefractive effects, are extrinsic properties. That is, if you look up the refractive index of um, uh, barium borate, it is what it is. And almost any vendor's barium borate, unless they've done something badly wrong, will, to within five significant digits, be the same refractive index. On the other hand, you could buy two barium borate crystals from two different vendors, and the absorption coefficient could be one or two orders of magnitude different, depending on what impurities found their way into the crystal or uh, uh, what other errors were made during the growth and processing of the material. So, if you look in a book of tabular data on the properties of optical materials, you will almost invariably find, for any important material, pretty good data for the linear properties like the refractive index. You'll almost never find a tabulation of the absorption coefficient of the material because there is not just one number. There can be a huge range of numbers uh, for a given material. And as we'll discuss a bit, even the conditions under which you measure some of these uh, extrinsic properties, the photorefractive effect in lithium niobate is quite different if you operate the crystal at 100 degrees C than if you operate it at 25 degrees C. 
So what number are you going to put in the book, even if there were a single number for a given temperature, which there isn't? So my point is these extrinsic properties are far less deterministically knowable than the ones that we tend to write about in the textbooks, like the nonlinear coefficient and uh, the refractive indices, for example. And we'll see how that concern will arise a few times. A last point to make about this is this part, uh, these kind of properties, you know, you've invented a clever new uh, organic uh, molecule with a huge uh, a static dipole moment and enormous nonlinear coefficients, and maybe you figured out how to make a cubic millimeter crystal of it. That kind of stuff is fun, especially if you're a physical chemist. Uh, and uh, much of research is oriented around finding materials with intrin uh, interesting intrinsic properties. Uh, and you can get a lot of government funding for that because many funding agencies feel novelty is more important than utility. But uh, if you actually look at what matters for practical applications or for earning money if you're a crystal growth company, it turns out it's often this junk that very rarely will you see a FizRev letter about, I figured out I can reduce the absorption coefficient from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 5 inverse centimeters if I anneal this crystal in iodine for an hour at 1,200 degrees. You know, it's just not fun. It's nose to the grindstone, tedious material engineering that can often fix these extrinsic properties, but you find most of us would much prefer to be working at this end of the spectrum. And in many ways, it's easier to work at that end of the spectrum. Okay, so um, we spoke a bit last time about some of these sorts of properties and how we could choose new materials, maybe a UV transparent ferroelec uh, ferroelectric or a orientation pattern semiconductor that might uh, overcome some of the intrinsic limits. That is, once you're in the multi-phonon absorption region of a crystal, it doesn't matter how cl clever the crystal grower is, that crystal will show that multi-phonon absorption. It's an intrinsic property of the crystal matrix. It's not something sensitive to tiny amounts of impurities or other, or other issues. But we didn't talk about this side of the curve, and that was the one I was just emphasizing on the previous slide. What can we say about residual absorption at the 10 to the minus 3 or 5, uh, 4 or 5 inverse centimeter level? What are the implications of it, and what can we do to characterize it, and what do we know about these sorts of aging phenomena that will degrade crystals over time? And that's the kind of stuff, the kind of stuff that researchers like us don't want to talk about. Uh, we want to be up here, but this talk will be at the dirty end of the spectrum. Okay, so why do we care about absorption? Well, for some uh, applications, it's a very simple and straightforward piece of physics. If you've built a resonator, the lower the finesse of the res sorry, the higher the absorption coefficient of the crystal, at least if it dominates over other losses like bad anti-reflection coatings and whatever, it can limit the finesse of your, uh, of your system. And as Majid illustrated in a slide uh, comparing various of the uh, nonlinear materials suitable for CWOPOs, it can, for example, raise the threshold pump power required to make the gain overcome the loss. The gain is what it is for a given pump power and a given nonlinear coefficient. That's not going to change crystal to crystal. What will change and can change the threshold of the OPO significantly is the loss in the crystal. It's very hard to find a crystal with 10 times higher nonlinearity than the one you've got, but it's not always that hard to find one with 10 times less loss, and those would have the same impact on the threshold of the OPO assuming that the loss in your system is dominated by the crystal's own loss. So uh, as uh, I think Feynman once said, there's a lot of room at the bottom, maybe a lot more room than there is at the top. So uh, loss can matter in straightforward, physically uh, understandable fashions. When you have absorption in a crystal, you in many cases will generate free carriers, especially in semiconductor media. 
you have some mid-gap state, you will photoionize that state, you've now got an electron in the conduction band or a hole in the valence band. It can often be the case that the properties of the crystal change more from those induced carriers than from the original absorption. That is, if you make a certain concentration of free carriers in a gallium arsenide or in a silicon crystal, you'll have free carrier absorption, which can be larger than the original absorption that generated the, those carriers in the first place. And you can have free carrier dispersion. The refractive index of the material can depend on the concentration of those carriers. And so your beam might get distorted by the properties that were altered by the carriers generated by the absorption. You can start to see why this stuff is hard to just put down in one paragraph. This is the misbehavior of a given material. Obviously, the context in which you operate it can have a huge, make huge differences in, in what kind of misbehaviors you will see. Um, a very common kind of issue, especially as average powers go up, I suspect we may hear a little of this from uh, Thomas Sudmeier. In fact, we heard some of this in his discussion of how do you power scale a laser. Uh, if you absorb a lot of power in uh, uh, a medium, in a crystal, you will typically get a radial variation in the temperature. Where you deposit the most heat, it will be hottest, maybe at the center of your Gaussian beam. And in the wings, it will be cooler. So your initially homogeneous medium has become an inhomogeneous medium because its temperature is not uniform throughout. And that can cause, through the thermo-optic effect, lensing in that crystal. Uh, and that, in turn, can distort the modes of a cavity or distort the uh, wave front of a beam passing through it in a single pass configuration. This radially varying temperature can be very annoying. And in addition, uh, it can spoil the phase matching. Uh, the thermo-optic coefficient is typically dispersive. If I heat the crystal, the temperature will change more at the second harmonic frequency and at the fundamental frequency. Delta K will change. The phase matching condition will change. But you can't really fix it because it's varying from the center to the edge of your beam. So what are you going to do? You can adjust an oven temperature, but that moves the whole thing up and down. It doesn't just, it can't fix the problem throughout the whole radially varying temperature distribution. So there are, again, a variety of effects. And the importance of these obviously will change with the specific uh, problem that your uh, device that you're working on. So let's take a little bit closer look at the behavior of such a, such a uh, temperature field. So imagine you've got a crystal. Maybe it's a very big crystal compared to the size of a beam that you're putting through it, probably a Gaussian beam. And in steady state, the temperature field that is generated by the radial flow of heat away from this beam, that is, I'm absorbing some portion of this Gaussian beam, what would the temperature response of the crystal be? Well, there will be an average temperature rise, which will have to do with how far the beam is from your heat sink. But the more difficult thing to deal with is this radially varying temperature, as we were just discussing. Obviously, the temperature will rise the most at the center of this beam, and they'll fall off as you go towards the wings. And it turns out, oh, good. I don't want to give a talk without a font error. That's important. Uh, P here is pi, uh, so <laughs> apparently we're in Rome, not in Athens, and uh, uh, we've changed our alphabet. Um, OK, so uh, the temperature rise is proportional to the absorbed power. That is, if the absorption coefficient is alpha, the power going through this thing is P. That's the amount of heat you're depositing per unit volume, most on axis, least away from the axis. and the thermal conductivity enters into this thing because the thermal gradient required to get that heat out of the region where it's being deposited uh, goes up as the thermal conductivity goes down. So two crystals with the same absorption coefficient, if one of them has 10 times the thermal conductivity of the other, it will have 10 times less temperature rise. So the thermal conductivity, again, it seems kind of irrelevant to uh, nonlinear optics, but it can also, it can actually be quite important in determining how your crystal behaves. But in most cases, we don't care about the temperature rise. We care about the change in properties of the material. Most often, the property that we care about is the refractive index. So another piece of the equation, then, is what is the thermal optic co coefficient? Given a certain temperature rise here, 
how much does the index change? We'll call that coefficient beta sub t here. And so now, putting these things together, the refractive index change that will happen uh, on the axis of this beam will look like, oops, one more point. Uh, ultimately, you probably don't care about the refractive index. You actually care about the phase shift that the center of the beam sees compared to the edge of the beam. And so uh, there's a factor of 2 pi over lambda. So um, if we want to know uh, what is the, yeah, that looks like a typo. I seem to have lost a lambda. Uh, sorry, it doesn't really matter for our purposes. Uh, the index change or the phase shift basically, oh, I know, sorry. Uh, the longer this crystal is, the um, uh, larger the impact of a certain refractive index change because the phase shift per unit length is going to depend on the perturbation to the refractive index. If I double the length of the crystal, I'm going to double the uh, phase shift imposed on this beam. A very thin crystal for a given temperature rise will obviously distort your beam less than a thick crystal. So the phase shift scales like this, and I think there's probably a, a missing lambda there, but that's not going to change. Okay, so if the largest phase shift that you could tolerate due to not wanting to distort the modes of your cavity or whatever your constraint is, let's just say you can tolerate m pi of um, phase distortion in your system. Uh, if we then ask what constraint does that impose on the parameters of our problem, it says that the product of the maximum tolerable power and the length of that crystal, this part of this result here, is limited by <clears throat> the tolerable phase shift you have, this m pi, and depends on material properties as it says here. That is, uh, the, large, the smaller the absorption coefficient and the smaller the thermo-optic coefficient of your crystal, the more power length product I could put through it. And similarly, the higher the thermal conductivity of the crystal, the smaller the temperature rise I'll get, everything else being the same, and hence, the higher the power the system can tolerate. Um, if you remember, I think it was Benoit who pointed out that for an optimally focused nonlinear, uh, sorry, harmonic generation problem, the efficiency of your process turns out to scale with the product of the power and the length. And there's a chi 2 squared and stuff like that in this coefficient. And so if I've constrained the maximum product of power and length, then I've constrained the maximum efficiency I can get out of that material. And so uh, the maximum single pass efficiency I could hope to attain depends on some complicated collection of uh, material properties. And in particular, if we extract the square of the nonlinear coefficient over n squared, that enters into this this nonlinear efficiency, and that piece is the conventional figure of merit that we were talking about for materials, d squared over n squared. But if we actually are in a case where this thermal business is, is limiting us, the real figure of merit also contains three more material properties. And so uh, if you just compare d squared over n squared, you're unlikely to be using the figure of merit that will actually determine how well you can do, how efficient a device you could build if you're operating near your thermal limits. So if we go back and uh, look at this figure of merit and put in our uh, uh, extra pieces, the DNDT, the thermal co uh, conductivity, but we don't put in alpha yet because we don't know what it is because the tables didn't tell us. You have this comparison between these materials. Um, and we have this question still. Lithium nibate looks a lot better than KTP or LBO or BBO or whatever. And so I think the conclusion, uh, given the experimental reality of what is actually often used, that neglecting differences in the absorption coefficient is not a good idea if you actually want to understand how well a crystal is going to work in many real world applications. So, all right, if I'm correct, 
and alpha is important, why is it so rarely tabulated? Why is it such a hard number to find? Well, typically it's an extrinsic property. As we've discussed, it can vary from sample to sample depending on how that sample was prepared. It can be orders of magnitude different. It can be strongly wavelength dependent. If there is some OH overtone absorption uh, at uh, uh, 1.4 microns in your crystal, well, that might be a bad wavelength to operate at, but at 1.5 microns, that could be almost negligible. So uh, the wavelength dependence, uh, A, makes it harder to measure uh, adequately, and two, harder to tabulate, because now what are you going to have? A table, a graph? OK. It can be power dependent. The photochromic effects we were just talking about can change, again, by orders of magnitude in a given sample, the absorption coefficient that you'll see. The presence of one wavelength can affect another. There is a phenomenon known as Greera and Blira, <laughs> green-induced infrared absorption and blue-induced infrared absorption. And you might measure very carefully the absorption coefficient at one micron, and then you turn on the second harmonic generation process, and suddenly your crystal is a very different crystal. It uh, turns out to be quite a common phenomenon. And it can be time dependent. In the first minute you measure the crystal, you might get one number, and an hour later, the number could be different. So there's a good, there are good reasons why the absorption is difficult to describe and difficult to tabulate, but that doesn't mean it isn't important, as we see from the actual choice of the use of different of these crystals. Um, another well, a related question is, what is the transmission of a crystal? That is, if you are lucky enough to find some data on the absorption properties of the crystal you're interested in, you might see a graph like this. This is one from an article about KTP. And if you look at this, it's called the transmittance as a function of wavelength. Uh, this is probably about 350 nanometers out here. This is about three microns in the mid-infrared. And a few things might strike you if you looked at that curve and you wanted to say, well, what, what, given that I know that curve, what number do I put in there? Well, you haven't the foggiest idea, unless you're working out here in the opaque region of the crystal or something. This 80% line is the Fresnel reflections off the two surfaces of the crystal that somebody put in a spectrophotometer. This isn't absorption, this difference between 100 and 80. It's just the transmission of the crystal. So if you'd AR coded that crystal or, some, or calibrated out the Fresnel reflections, this would be pretty close to 100%. Uh, this little glitch here probably means not that your crystal has a step function in its absorption, probably means that the uh, detector in his spectrophotometer is badly aligned, and it just switched from the PMT to the photodiode. So um, that's almost never real. And he didn't tell you how long the crystal is. So even if this piece here represented some absorption, if I don't know if it's a millimeter or a centimeter, I don't know anything about the absorption. That is, a crystal that transmits 90% uh, in a one millimeter thickness transmits 35% in a one centimeter thickness because there's a, it's proportional to thickness in an exponent, right? So uh, this curve is absolutely, oops, absolutely useless to you other than to tell you you probably don't want to work at 200 nanometers and you probably don't want to work at 3,000 nanometers in this material, but that's about all. So when you see a transparency range given in a table like the one I showed in my talk, I sort of intentionally did that badly uh, to make a point because that's probably the most you'll see in a tabular collection of data is that kind of information. And that really doesn't tell you about the 10 to the minus 3 or 4 or 5 inverse centimeter absorptions that actually enter into the kinds of calculations I was just describing. This plot here is a little bit more uh, responsible. It gives the length of the crystal. It has a transmission of 1 instead of 0.8, which means the Fresnel reflections off the facets of this crystal have been corrected for. But still, 
I don't think most of us are able to tell whether this line is 1 or 0.9999, and that's the difference between 10 to the minus 4 inverse centimeters of absorption and no absorption. So you can tell a little bit more from this, uh, this plot, but not a lot more. Uh, for the record, this is multiphonon absorption out here in the KTP. This is intrinsic. This little spike here at around 2.8 or 2.9 microns, that's an OH vibration. There must be some hydrogen contamination in that crystal. So uh, this feature is quite extrinsic. This is quite intrinsic. And you haven't any idea what's going on up here, other than it's not terrible. Well, it could be terrible, but um, you just don't know. OK, so when you see a transparency range plotted in, uh, sorry, given in some graph, that mostly just tells you you don't want to work outside that range. It doesn't really tell you how well you can work inside that range. Oops. So uh, as I mentioned a couple of times, absorption and the resulting thermal lensing can be rather complicated. Um, uh, this is. Uh, a measurement of the absorption at one micron in a piece of lithium niobate. Uh, this is zero. This is about 10 to the minus 3 inverse centimeters. This is about 5 times 10 to the minus 3 inverse centimeters. So what is, uh, this is being measured as a function of time. And why is there this square variation? Why is it high here and low there? Well, in these regions where there's a green bar, the sample was co-illuminated with a green laser. And when the laser was on, the infrared absorption went up. When the laser was turned off, it was three times less absorption. So uh, that is a manifestation of this phenomenon of green-induced infrared absorption in this crystal. So even if you were careful and you made your own measurement of the absorption of this crystal, and you said, oh, that's fine. I can tolerate 10 to the minus 3 inverse centimeters. Then you put it in your harmonic generation apparatus or your green pumped OPO, and the thing works very badly. Well. You neglected to worry about this kind of induced absorption phenomenon. Uh, uh, the absorption can be time dependent. This is a plot in a piece of KTP of the green light absorption as a function of time. And you can see it goes from rather small to uh, uh, more than an order of magnitude larger over the span of a few tens of seconds of exposure uh, to relatively intense green radiation. Um, another topic is uh, that can make it complicated to understand what the absorption behavior of your beam is, is this is a measurement of this gray track, as it's called, in lithium niobate, but in a spatially resolved fashion. So, this is where the green beam was going through the crystal. So this is a distance. Uh, it's a 100 micron spot going through the crystal. And with a different tool I'll talk about later, you can measure the spatially resolved absorption in that crystal. And what you find after the gray track has developed for a while is actually where the green beam is, the absorption is rather low. But on either side of it, the absorption has increased a lot. And depending on whether you're measuring the absorption in the infrared, it's either the left side or the right side of the beam that has the stronger absorption. So that's an interesting phenomenon. It also explains why sometimes you can have a crystal like gray track KTP in an experiment, and it's operating OK. And then you bump the table, and the crystal breaks. And you say, gee, that was just a little tap. Why did the crystal break? Well, the crystal broke because you wiggled your crystal 50 microns, and the beam went into the strongly absorbing part, heated it up, and it broke. So uh, this is not the kind of thing you typically think about when you think about using a crystal, but this kind of phenomenon is not entirely unusual. So uh, uh, we'll talk a bit more about the phenomena going on here uh, a little later on. but. The point is, again, all right, how do you put this into your table of absorption coefficients? You know, it's just not easily done. It's not that people are stupid or lazy. It's just that these are complicated phenomena.
Okay, so how might you measure absorption uh, at the levels necessary here, which means somewhere 10 to minus 3, 4, 5 inverse centimeters? And uh, how can you spatially, spatially resolve it with the kind of resolution it would take to know things like this? Oops. Things like this. If you just put your crystal in a spectrophotometer, which would be the most obvious thing to do, or even if you just put it in a laser beam, you might get some spatial resolution if you measure the transmission of the laser beam. But remember, the Fresnel reflections off your crystal are going to take 80 uh, sorry, 20 percent, say, of the power out of the beam as it passes through your crystal. You don't care about the reflections off the surface. When you properly prepare that crystal with AR coatings, you can get rid of that, most of that reflection loss. So you're trying to measure a 10 to minus 3 or 4 change in the transmission of that crystal in the presence of 20 percent of loss of transmission due to innocuous effects like reflections. So that's not an easy way to make the measurement with the precision necessary here. What you would like is a measurement that is not 1 minus a small number. You want to measure the small number directly if you want to make an accurate measurement. So you want a measurement that is explicitly proportional to the absorbed power rather than measuring the remaining power and trying to process that to infer how much power you lost. So one scheme that might, or one class of schemes that might be used for such a purpose are uh, calorimetric schemes. That is, if you measure the temperature rise, and we just argued the temperature rise was proportional to the absorbed pump power, if uh, there's no absorption, there's no temperature rise, uh, and so you don't have any signal. So you've got a zero offset signal of the sort we were seeking if uh, you have a way to measure the temperature rise in the crystal. One way you could do that is put a thermocouple on the crystal, put it in a vacuum box, turn on your laser, and wait a long time. That's not easy, and it turns out you're often dominated by junk on the surface of the crystal. You're not actually measuring the internal volume properties of the crystal. You're measuring something else, and those are very hard measurements to make because they, well, you can imagine trying to measure millikelvin temperature rises in a, yeah. It's not the best way to do it unless you're in a very special situation. So something a little cleverer might be an interferometric method. Imagine you put your uh, green laser beam through the crystal if I want to measure the absorption in the green. So I've got a temperature rise now at the center of this beam and hence a refractive index change. Well, we just said the problem with that is it causes a phase shift on a beam of light passing through that increased temperature region. So if I could measure the phase shift on a probe beam going through this crystal, I'm making a measurement of the phase shift uh, or the change in phase shift and that in turn will be connected to the temperature rise. So that's not a stupid thing to do. Maybe you put a mock sender interferometer around your crystal and you look at the phase shifts uh, in the presence of this pump beam. That's almost a good idea. And you can be quite sensitive because obviously with a carefully constructed interferometric measurement, you can measure nano radians of phase shift. Unfortunately, uh, there's other things that will shift the phase of this uh, Mach tender interferometer, most commonly vibrations, noise, whatever. And so uh, because you are limited, in, you, obviously you would chop this pump beam to make an AC temperature measurement, fine. But the thermal diffusion time across your beam will limit that to maybe a kilohertz kind of chopping rate. And uh, you're sitting smack in the middle of all the acoustic noise in the world. And so mostly you will have built a microphone, unless you're very careful about this thing, you won't have built a thing that will measure the quantity you're interested in. So what would be nice is to find uh, an interferometric scheme that evades this kind of uh, stability issue and still lets you make a measurement probably close to the shot noise limit, if you do it right, of the phase shift imposed on this beam. So a technique that we have used to make such measurement, measurements is something we call a common path photothermal interferometer. More commonly, we call it an alexometer. 
Alex Alexandrovsky was the guy who developed this in our lab, so it became an alexometer. Um, it's easier to say than common path photothermal interferometer. So how does this thing work? Uh, here's the sample you want to measure. Here's the green beam that you're putting through it. So you've got a temperature rise in the region of this beam. Maybe it's 100 microns or something size, something convenient. And of course, you've chopped this so the temperature rise is AC. It's going up and down at perhaps a kilohertz. If I now illuminate this crystal with a probe beam, uh, say a helium neon laser or a diode laser, something reasonably quiet and bigger in diameter, so this is a larger Gaussian beam than this one, what happens to it as it passes through this uh, region? Well, it will pick up a phase shift in this heated portion because the refractive index changed, and it will be an AC phase shift, so there'll be a little plus, minus, plus, minus phase bump on my probe beam as a result of the absorption of the pump beam. Well, if I just put a photodiode out here, I wouldn't see anything because I haven't changed the transmission of my probe beam. I've only changed its phase. But if I go, you can kind of view the probe here as the sum of an initial Gaussian with a flat phase front and a little perturbed Gaussian-like bump representing that phase bump. And as we know, Gaussian beams undergo GUI phases. And so this inner region, if you go a GUI, sorry, a, a confocal length, uh, roughly, away from the crystal, this inner portion will have phase shifted with respect to the rest of the probe beam. So it will now, instead of being a pure phase modulation, it will turn into an amplitude modulation as this perturbed part of the beam interferes with the unperturbed part of the beam. So you'll get a little phase bump, uh, sorry, amplitude bump going up and down in the center of this beam as a res in proportion to, oops, in proportion to this phase shift here. And uh, if I detected all the power, I would still see nothing because all I've done is redistribute the power by this interferometric uh, phenomenon. But uh, if I put an aperture here that's about the size of this diffracted perturbed region, the transmission through this aperture, it turns out, has exactly the same delta intensity over intensity as a perfectly biased Mach tender interferometer. So you haven't really gained sensitivity that way, but what you have gained is the fact that this is a completely common path system, so it's immune to vibrations, it's immune to uh, air currents, so at least to first order immune to air currents, because they perturb the inner region and the outer region of the probe the same way, so they don't cause any differential phase shift. So long story short, if I chop this green laser at a kilohertz and I measure the kilohertz change in transmission through this... Um, uh, through this aperture, I can make more or less a shot noise limited measurement of the phase shift and hence infer what the temperature change inside that beam was. And the spatial resolution in the transverse dimension is set by the size of this beam. So if I focus it to 100 microns, I can make a 100 micron spatially resolved measurement. I don't have any longitudinal resolution because I don't know if the absorption happened on the surface or in the volume if I do the thing this way. But if you tilt these beams at a small angle, the probe and the pump, and fiddle around a little bit, maybe you've got a slit now instead of an aperture. But the point is, uh, only in the regions where the beams cross does the phase shift due to the heating by this beam influence that probe beam. And so you can make a spatially resolved measurement in that fashion by just crossing the beams. So you have kind of a trade-off of sensitivity and spatial resolution. You get the biggest signal when they're parallel. You get the, biggest, uh, the best spatial resolution when they're crossed at some angle. So you can uh, trade off those two parameters of the system. But it's easy to measure 10 to the minus 5 inverse centimeters with, say, a watt of pump power. And in carefully controlled conditions, we've measured 100 part per billion per centimeter kind of absorptions with this kind of tool because you can make phase measurements so accurately. So this is more than adequate for the kind of problems we're talking about here. And it turns out Alex left Stanford. He started a company called Stanford Photothermal Solutions, and he's got a few dozen of these things out in the world commercially. You can buy them. <laughs>
And he also does contract measurements for crystal growth companies and the like who want to know how good is my crystal. Well, they send it off to Alex and he'll send back a number. Okay, so uh, in addition to having spatial resolution, uh, this thing has pretty good temporal resolution. You're limited just by sort of thermal diffusion times and chopping frequencies to maybe uh, tens of milliseconds, but that's not too bad. And so you can trace out this behavior of a time-dependent absorption just by tracking the output of that uh, 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 alexometer and follow the dynamics of these various induced absorption phenomena. Now, like I said, you can examine separately the front surface, the central portion, or the back surface of your crystal just by translating it through these, these cross beams. And that's how this measurement was in fact made. It was using the res spatial resolution of that apparatus to read out these uh, absorptions that are changing on 100 micron spatial scales. Okay, so uh, among the kind of things you learn when you have a system like that is, uh, in many cases, it's the surface of your sample that dominates its total loss. Depends how skilled the coating shop was that put the AR coatings down, how clean the crystal was when they put their coatings down, you can see absorptions. This is a, just a simple fused silica beam splitter. Fused silica has very little absorption in the bulk at one micron, but you can see 80 parts per million of absorption on the front surface and uh, about half that on the back surface. Uh, this just is a manifestation of a poorly done anti-reflection coating with a lot of absorption in it. If you had just made a straight through measurement of that sample, you wouldn't have known that it was a very low loss crystal with a bad surface, you would have just seen the total loss of the sample. But by doing this kind of spatially resolved measurement, you can learn some things about the internal properties of the sample in the presence of uh, uh, significant surface losses. Yeah, this was a real shocker. LBO is a wonderful crystal. Uh, typically less than five ppm per centimeter absorption in the green. That's one reason it's such a high, sorry, attractive for high average power applications. Uh, but it has a small nonlinear coefficient, so you're often using it in some kind of intracavity or resonant configuration. And this is a measurement of a particular LBO crystal we looked at once. And these two surfaces, you can see, are vastly dominating over the volume absorption. And so uh, uh, it's just there's not much you can do about that unless you call up Alex and ask him to make a measurement for you. But uh, it is a useful thing to keep in mind that many cases your problem, if you have a thermal loading problem, might be dominated by a poorly prepared surface and not by the volume of the material, especially if you have bought a low loss crystal explicitly to avoid those kind of absorption related issues. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about absorption since we think it's important and we think it's hard to characterize. What general things can you keep in mind about the absorption in a crystal? Well, um, there are typically two intrinsic mechanisms for absorption in the transparency range of a crystal. Multiphonon, so this is a plot versus, this is fused silica, which is a poor choice, but it was what I could find at the 2 a.m. last night. Um, so this is uh, the wavelength, this is the extinction coefficient, that's the sum of absorption plus scattering, in fused silica. Uh, so this is 10 to the minus 5 inverse centimeters, that's 1 inverse centimeters, it's a log scale. So out here in the infrared, you see this steeply rising line growing after about uh, 1.8 or something microns and rising to about an inverse centimeter by the time you're in the mid-infrared at, at several micron wavelengths. Uh, multiphonon absorption typically scales as um, e to the sum constant over wavelength, so it is a, a positive exponent. So as you go to uh, longer wavelengths, this guy is increasing steeply. This uh, edge here is uh, the band tail of the ultraviolet absorp electronic absorption, which typically, again, scales as an exponent of some constant over lambda, but negatively. So as you move away from the band gap, the absorption is dropping steeply. 
And so these things will cross in a characteristic V-shaped curve, which is known as the V-curve for that material. So somewhere typically in the near infrared for oxide materials, you will see uh, a minimum in their absorption. This other line here is the Rayleigh scattering, which goes like lambda to the minus four. In crystals, you typically don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, that's the inhomogeneity and the frozen liquid of glass that causes the scattering, but it's on the graph. But these two lines are in crystals too, and so typically you would think you might have in a good crystal losses of 10 to minus five or something in this notch, 10 to minus five inverse centimeters. What you typically see is something much worse. Uh, and in the transparency region, there's some junk, some extrinsic absorption associated with impurities, native defects, other crap in the crystal. So only in very, oops, very carefully prepared materials like the very clean fused silica that is used in optical fibers, do you actually manage to get to the bottom of this valley? In most materials, something else will happen first, at least down here, but then as you go, if you remember the edges of our transmission curve, as you get closer to the band gap or deeper into the multiphonon absorption, the intrinsic absorption will start to dominate over the junk extrinsic absorption. The little bump, if you've ever looked at fused silica, there's a low loss point at 1.3 microns and a low loss point at 1.5 microns, and there's a little extra loss around 1.4. That turns out, not that it matters for our discussion, but it's an example of the junk absorption. If there's any residual hydrogen in the fused silica, there's an OH vibration with a fundamental wavelength around 2.8 microns, and the first overtone of that is at 1.4 microns, and that's what that little bump in the absorption of fused silica is. But those are very carefully purified materials. If you take a typical nonlinear optical crystal, as I say, you'll find a lot of crap, as we'll talk about, that's um, going to limit the absorption of this region much higher than that. Okay, so these are the intrinsic absorption mechanisms that typically exist in these crystals. There's another intrinsic mechanism, uh, which is two-photon absorption. Once the photon energy uh, exceeds half the band gap, you can have a two-step, uh, sorry, an instantaneous two-photon absorption, which is, again, an intrinsic property of the material, uh, uh, and it is what it is. It's not something that you can do anything about. And so if you look at high intensities, you will see an absorption coefficient that is the sum of the low intensity absorption plus, for the simple-minded, instantaneous two-photon absorption, some coefficient characteristic of the material times the intensity. So as you go to high intensities, you will see an increasing absorption coefficient. The wavelength, there are some moderately general things you can say about the scaling of this two-photon absorption as the photon energy exceeds half the band gap. And there's a nice paper from uh, Eric von Stryland and Sheikh Baha'i uh, that talks about that scaling. Okay, so what kind of junk exists? Now, uh, I mean, obviously we can't talk about a catalog of all materials. Let's talk about lithium nibate and tantalate. One, because they're moderately well understood, and two, it's the slides I had. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> Uh, if this was our intrinsic band tail absorption in the ultraviolet, the position of that thing for lithium nibate is about 320 nanometers, and lithium tantalate about 260 nanometers, though one, very, uh, one never sees operation all the way out to here. And then at the other end, somewhere around four microns, you'll start to see multiphonon absorption rise above the junk absorption in the crystal. And so what kind of junk might one have? Well, you can have states in the band gap due to the presence of some defect. Uh, if you have a part per million of chrome or iron or something inside the crystal, that uh, 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 those ions in the crystal will have some characteristic energy levels. And so uh, uh, if you excite an electron from one of those defect states into the conduction band, or sometimes from one defect state to another, uh, you can absorb photons that should be in the transparency range because they're well below the band gap energy, but characteristic of a given defect will be a set of these uh, mid-gap levels. 
And, no, and that typically is something you would see in the visible or in some cases in the near infrared. As you go into the mid infrared, it's more likely you've got a defect, perhaps hydrogen, and there's a vibrational mode of the hydrogen adjacent to uh, uh, an oxygen. In the case of lithium niobate, then the vibrational frequency of that mode or some of its overtones, if your photon energy happens to hit those, you will again see an absorption associated with this kind of defect. And you can also have defects related not to an impurity, but say you've got a, uh, a niobium sitting on a lithium site. Well, that will have its own set of gap defect levels, and it will have some absorptions. OK. So, uh, so the contributions to the absorption in different parts of the spectrum might be different. And in typical crystals, you might see 10 to minus 3 or 4 inverse centimeters in the near infrared and rising to a messy looking shoulder in the vicinity of the UV. So the practical limit on many of these kinds of crystals is not this intrinsic band edge behavior, but rather something to do with impurities and stoichiometry of the crystal. Uh, this is just a plot showing this lumpy region measured for a particular lithium niobate crystal, magnesium doped lithium niobate crystal. And you can see uh, when you're out at 800 nanometers, the absorption is pretty small, but there's a nasty rise to actually uh, 10 to minus 2 inverse centimeters in this particular crystal. Differing, I might note, for the O and the E wave, you can have rather different absorptions. Sometimes they're strongly polarized. And then rising off to this intrinsic misbehavior as you go to shorter wavelengths. OK, so how, if you actually wanted to understand how to oops, improve such a crystal, if you were a crystal grower, or how to understand the limitations on your crystal, if you're a crystal user, or if you're the kind of person who complains a lot and you want to yell at the person you're buying your crystals from, uh, you'd like to have something as specific as possible to grumble about, um, it's, uh, uh, you need to know the origin of some of these properties. And, uh, some materials like lithium niobate have been pretty well studied. There was an era of photorefractive physics where people were intentionally inducing refractive index changes to do dynamic holography and things like that. And that involved the presence of impurities doped into the crystal to allow you to write these kind of phase gratings into the medium. Um, and uh, there are a set of known discrete features from chrome in the uh, visible and near infrared uh, in the blue uh, and blue-green regions, chrome and iron can make contributions. But it's not, a, you know, these aren't little narrow atomic absorption bands like you would see in a gas discharge. These are broad, messy features, so it's often difficult to assign a particular uh, misbehavior to a particular uh, material. So we did a study with Crystal Tech where they grew some heavily doped materials with a variety of common transition metal impurities chrome, uh, copper, iron, uh, manganese, uh, and some other materials like silicon, platinum, to see what might come off of a crucible. And you get some beautifully colored crystals out of that job. But by intentionally making one of the impurities dominate the total absorption, you can more clearly resolve the, mis the contribution of that material over all the rest of the materials, impurities that might be afflicting your crystal. You can figure out what the absorption cross-section of that impurity is, and then infer what you would expect, because it's generally linear in the concentration when you're not at 100 parts per million of this impurity, but 0.1 part per million of that impurity. So uh, the details of this study are obviously not relevant. It's just indicative of what you can do. But here you can see measurements uh, in the visible and near infrared for iron, chrome, copper, nickel, manganese, and you see these broad lumpy features here that uh, are character, but they're strong, right? These are inverse centimeter absorptions, even for some tens of part per million of these impurities. But you can process this data, figure out a cross-section. You can analyze the composition by mass spectroscopy or something of a given not intentionally doped sample. And then you can make a weighted sum of the contributions of these different materials and see what dominates the absorption of that sample. And that's what was done here. And here is the 
measured absorption in this particular nominally optical grade piece of magnesium doped lithium nibate, and these dashed lines are the sums of the contributions of copper, iron, chrome, nickel, and manganese. Turns out that a tenth of a part per million of copper, 1.5 parts per million of iron, and one tenth of a part per million of chrome are enough to explain quite accurately the known the observed absorption feature of these materials. So again, it's not that crystal growers are stupid or lazy, but keeping 100 parts per billion of an impurity out of a crystal as you're growing it, it means you've bought some fairly expensive starting materials, and you've been very careful with your crystal growth furnace and its cleanliness and many things to get even to this level. So it's one reason why these uh, ext extrinsic absorptions are so omnipresent. All right, let's not worry too much about that range. Um, in the mid-infrared, you're often dealing with a different class of problems. Uh, so out here, instead of in this visible near-infrared shoulder region, uh, this is a plot of the absorption of the E wave and the, yeah, the E wave of a piece of lithium niobate. And you see there's a big peak here at about 2,850 nanometers. That's an OH vibration. And so historically, uh, sorry, it's the O wave that has this big absorption. So historically, one didn't want to operate lithium niobate in that region. Uh, <clears throat> we made some more careful measurements. And if you look at the fine print, uh, you can see that there is this lumpy absorption here in the E wave. And it's not negligible. It's uh, half a percent per centimeter around wavelengths where lithium nibate was conventionally thought to be transparent. And we thought, like many people did, that that was so. And we tried to build an OPO. Uh, this was for a free space communication thing. We wanted something. Uh, it turned out we wanted the resonant wave to be at 2.6 microns to make this whole thing work. And we said, ah, that's fine. It's a low loss region. This guy should work fine as a CW. OPO pumped by an amplified uh, erbium, uh, sorry, uh, semiconductor laser amplified in an erbium fiber. Yeah, we said the threshold is probably going to be a few watts uh, for reasonable absorptions. And our 20 watt EDFA here, we couldn't make the thing oscillate. It just didn't work. So um, we made these measurements. That's what led us to make these measurements. And uh, in fact, with that half a percent per centimeter, that's 2.5% loss in a 5 centimeter long crystal. That's not negligible, as Majid was saying. And that can push your threshold from a few watts to a few tens of watts, where it's kind of unrealistic to operate this material. So anyway, we developed a thermal annealing process where you could put this thing in an oven at 1,000 degrees for a while. You could drive out the hydrogen. And you could knock the absorption coefficient down by nearly an order of magnitude compared to the absorption coefficient in the as received samples. And when we did that, sure enough, uh, this OPO started working, belting out three watts of power. And I think this was the first time anyone ever operated a 1.5 micron pumped uh, lithium nibate OPO. So again, the, the point is not that you're necessarily going to face this exact problem, but these are the kind of things you ought to think about if you're building some device that might be sensitive to loss and it's not working right. Well, just because conventional wisdom says your material doesn't absorb, when you're sensitive at this kind of level to absorption, you may want to do something more careful to decide, are you, in fact, going to be afflicted by this kind of misbehavior? OK. Uh, yeah, infrared absorption. Um, as you, <laughs> you can, you, I, I, I won't, uh, both because I don't want to and I know you don't want me to, but you could go on for hours talking about the various kinds of junk you can observe idiosyncratically. It's sadly not something where you can say, and here's the big picture, this is how it works. It might be chrome that's bothering this material. It might be copper that's bothering that material. It might be OH bothering either of those materials at a different wavelength range. It is just sadly rather idiosyncratic. Uh, so take this more as a long cautionary tale about the things you should worry about if you're ever in building devices in regimes where this sort of thing matters. And maybe it gives you a few ways to think about what's going on. OK, so imagine that you're uh, Tomas Sudmeier and you're trying to generate 500 watts of something in, in, a, in a 
uh, mode locked uh, laser or something. Um, as we said, there's not much you can do given a certain amount of absorption in a crystal to evade the temperature rise that will accompany the absorption of that intense beam. The center to edge temperature rise we saw was independent of the size of this uh, beam. If you make it bigger, the thermal field will have a larger curvature, but going from the edge to the center of the beam, you will see exactly the same temperature rise for a radially cooled system. So you got nowhere to go with that. You can't just say, I'll make the beam bigger, that'll fix it. No, it won't. You'll have exactly the same problem. But uh, you can do things, the same kind of things that are done in laser engineering to address the management of this kind of heat flow. For example, um, if you make the beam elliptical and you pull the heat out through the thin dimension of your beam, now you're no longer in this symmetrical, radially cooled regime. And this guy, you can scale the heat removal from more gracefully than you can this one. In an extreme limit, uh, a proposal from Dave Imerell at Livermore Lab some years ago was a so-called face pump scheme where the diameter of the beam is actually larger than the thickness of the sample. And that's not a hard regime to get to, especially with mode locked lasers where you're going to have a rather uh, short crystal to accommodate the bandwidth of that laser. Uh, and uh, the spot size doesn't have to be very small because you have very high peak intensities in such a mode locked pulse drain. So for those kind of problems, uh, this kind of geometry makes sense where you're actually cooling longitudinally along the beam propagation direction. And the kind of proposal that Imerell made was, well, you can flow helium gas or something over the surface of this crystal to pull the heat away. And now your temperature gradients are longitudinal, not transverse. And this is a much more graceful thermal scaling than you get from either this or, oops, or this. Uh, oops. But you do need uh, uh, to have rather high peak powers and a high quality beam if you want to make that scheme work. But if you care to see how this kind of scaling works in the face cooled geometries, uh, take a look at that reference from Imerl. Okay, so in the last 20 minutes or so, I think that's right, yes? Let's take a quick look at some of these photo-induced property changes. They're among the more complicated and sadly, at least in many of these ferroelectric crystals, common misbehaviors that you might have to worry about. So this is a green Gaussian beam as it goes through free space. If I put a one centimeter long lithium nibate crystal in that beam, this is probably a few milliwatts, 10 milliwatts of green light. Uh, in a matter of five or 10 seconds, the beam will look like this. You don't want this, usually. Um, unless you're doing laser art or something, there's not much use to a, a beam that's so distorted. And this has been distorted by refractive index changes that were induced in the crystal by the presence of the visible light. There's probably some kind of modulation instability uh, in this induced refractive index change, and you start to see gratings form and all sorts of complex scattering phenomena. Uh, again, the details of the scattering aren't that important to us, whether it's the details of this shape don't matter. It's going to not be a nice zero, zero mode laser beam. And as we discussed, we can also have induced absorptions in the presence of green light, infrared absorption can change. These are both extrinsic properties. A clean crystal with no defects won't do this, at least not until you have two photon absorption going on. So uh, these are called aging properties because these kinds of phenomena can emerge over minutes or hours or days depending on the nature of the, of the crystal. And um, uh, uh, the fact that your sample has worked great for the first 10 minutes of your experiment doesn't necessarily mean it'll work well an hour or a day later. Some of these things grow rather slowly. So um, uh, these transient changes in absorption 
are often known as green-induced infrared absorption or whatever color is doing the inducing. Um, things that last a long time, which are also photochromic effects but don't go away when the light goes away, have generically been called gray tracking. You tend to see this more in KTP. You see the transient kind of absorptions more in lithium nibate and tantalate. Um, these photorefractive misbehaviors are by far the more serious ones in nibate and tantalate. And uh, uh, at room temperature, they're pretty bad in conventional lithium nibate. Turns out they decrease. You can run the crystal at higher temperatures. They get better. I think we'll have time to say a few words about that. Um, they are often complicated effects. The photorefraction can be worse when you have two colors present than when you have any one color by itself. It turns out that when you periodically pull these crystals, you can greatly reduce the sensitivity to photorefraction, which is an interesting uh, fact that I hope we can touch on as well. And uh, gray tracking itself is rather complicated in its dependence on the experimental parameters. A given crystal might behave nicely with a 10 hertz rep rate uh, Q-switched laser at a given set of pulse energies. But if you illuminate it with a kilohertz or a 10 kilohertz pulse train, it could gray track very badly. That is, there are transient species involved with lifetimes on the order of milliseconds. So the exact nature of the time sequence of illuminations can alter this kind of behavior. So you might test your crystal at 10 watts of average power with one kind of pulse format, and it's great. And then you try a different pulse format, and it misbehaves at one watt. So again, cataloging all the ways that these things can, can behave is a fool's errand, especially in a 20 minutes of a talk. But just be aware that there's very complex phenomena here. So if you're ever in the position of needing to decide whether a crystal is adequate for your purposes, try to test it in as close to the actual circumstance as the one you're going to use it in for your final experiment. Otherwise, you might be sadly disappointed and have wasted a few hundred thousand dollars putting your system together. OK. Um, let me just give one example of that. Imagine that a vendor offers you a crystal with 10 to the minus 4 or 10 to the minus 5 inverse centimeters. Which one do you want to buy? Well, uh, let's just take a look. If a crystal was like this one, I'd say, well, probably doesn't make much difference. Here we're plotting the time-dependent gray track absorption in two different crystals. Uh, these behave moderately similarly, and they started out moderately similarly. So maybe that wouldn't have a big implication to the answer of that question. Here are two crystals, one of which is almost unmeasurable in its absorption. It's around 10 minus 5 inverse centimeters at low intensities. This other one is uh, uh, 5 times 10 minus 4, maybe 50 times worse. Then you turn on the light, and wham, the one that was originally 10 times better ends up being dramatically worse than the one that started out with low absorption. So the behavior at low intensities and it does not necessarily correlate with the behavior at high intensities. Don't take this to be a generic implication that all KTP crystals that are, sorry, good at low powers or bad at high powers, I'm just illustrating that can happen. So bear this kind of misbe uh, misbehavior in mind. Um, well, let's not talk too much about the details of gray tracking, but just in case you're curious how this kind of absorption behavior where the Green absorption is strong on one side, and the infrared absorption is strong on the other side. The best guess for what's going on here is potassium ions are migrating under the influence of uh, so-called photogalvanic current uh, to uh, move across the beam in the direction of the ferroelectric axis. So on one side of this crystal, you have an excess of potassium. And on the other side, you have a deficit of potassium. So the defects on these two sides of the crystal are different. And one of these kinds of defects absorbs green light more, oops, infrared light more. And the other kind of defect absorbs uh, green light more. And so you end up with this kind of asymmetric pattern. But the details of all that are A, not well understood, and B, not really relevant here. OK. Um,
A lot of ferroelectric materials will also show this photorefractive damage, this optically induced change in refractive index. And why should you care about the photoconductivity of lithium nibate? You're not building a photodetector. And yet, it turns out that the photoconductivity of lithium niobate really dominates the uh, size of the photorefraction. When somebody tells you, oh, you want to use a magnesium-doped lithium niobate crystal, or you want to use a stoichiometric lithium tantalate crystal because those will evade photorefractive damage, they're right. Uh, but the reason they're right is rather subtle. It's because you have altered the photoconductivity of the crystal. So uh, it turns out also when you uh, uh, raise the crystal temperature from room temperature to 100 or 150 degrees and you see a reduction in the photorefractive damage, that also turns out to be the, due to the fact that these are hopping conductors and their conductivity goes up as the temperature goes up. So buried in some subtle physics is the fact that the photoconductivity of these materials is a controlling parameter on how bad their photorefractive uh, uh, properties are. So um, I think we have enough time to take a look at why that is. It may not be too relevant to your lives, but uh, it's an interesting piece of physics. So um, material physics, maybe not quite nonlinear optical physics, though photorefraction used to be a major field of research in dynamic holography and signal processing and things like that, though it's kind of faded from importance in the modern era. And now, photorefraction is mostly an annoyance. OK, so uh, there's a phenomenon known as the bulk photovoltaic effect, discovered by Alistair Glass at Bell Labs back, I think, in the late, early 70s, probably. What that is a result of is, imagine you've got, say, an iron impurity sitting in a lithium nibate lattice. It's got some defect level. If you hit it with a sufficiently energetic photon, maybe in the red or the green, you can photoionize that impurity and make a, f a photoelectron, a free carrier. Because the lattice of lithium niobate is non-centrosymmetric, the direction along the ferroelectric polarization is different than the direction opposite to it, the p local potential in the vicinity of that defect is asymmetric. So when you absorb this photon, you will preferentially eject an electron, say, along the zedra axis as opposed to the minus z axis. And that means that if you wanted to write a constitutive relationship for the current, it's not just Ohm's law, j equals sigma times e, sigma being the electrical conductivity. There is this additional photogalvanic current representing the fact that you now have a net flow of electrons in one direction in proportion to the number of absorbed photons, that is, in proportion to the intensity. So if we call kappa that bulk photovoltaic coefficient, this is what the carrier transport looks like. This z hat means you're putting the electrons in the z direction in, in such a, pho, uh, a ferroelectric crystal. So what does that mean? Uh, to your life as an optical physicist. Well, if you've got a beam of light going through this crystal and you're preferentially ejecting electrons due to this photogalvanic effect in one direction, you're going to pile up electric charged negative electrons on one side, positively charged uh, uh, defects, the donors here, on the other side. And that will mean that a space charge field will start to emerge across your beam between these ionized dopant, uh, impurities and the trapped electrons. Well, if you've got a space charge field, you will start to drive a current by conventional ohmic current. And so there'll be a current flowing in the opposite direction due to the conductivity of the material. And this thing will reach steady state when the electric field, uh, space charge field, rises to the point where this ohmic current just balances the photogalvanic current. So you've got a way to create an electric field inside a crystal simply by illuminating it with light. It was very unclear why that was until Glass figured this thing out. So if we ask what is the space charge field that emerges in steady state when these two currents balance, so you have a net zero current, well, it's just when this term is equal and opposite to that term, 
So the space charge field grows with the size of the photogalvanic current, and it is reduced by the electrical conductivity. The larger the conductivity, the smaller the space charge field in steady state, because it takes less field to make this balancing current. The conductivity in the dark of lithium niobate is tiny. The dielectric relaxation time is a few months in the dark. It's almost a perfect insulator. On the other hand, uh, it has some finite photoconductivity because when you make these photocarriers by exciting them with your laser beam, they live for a while in the conduction band and they can be conduct, they can conduct uh, um, just like uh, any other uh, uh, carrier in your system. And so the total conductivity that appears here is both the dark conductivity and the photoconductivity. Let's just call the photoconductivity beta times the intensity. Typically, it's more or less linear in the intensity uh, because the rate that you're generating these carriers is linear in the intensity. Okay, so the space charge field in steady state now has this form where we've replaced the conductivity with the combination of dark and photoconductivities. Perhaps you're seeing what's coming here soon. Given that it takes very little light, a few microwatts per square centimeter, before the photoconductivity dominates over this tiny dark conductivity, then uh, when this bit of photoconductivity is dominating the denominator, the refractive index change, uh, sorry, the, sat the space charge field saturates at just the ratio of this photogalvanic coefficient to the photoconductivity. So as the intensity goes up, you just have a saturating kind of, refract uh, of space charge field. Of course, we care about not the space charge field, uh, though it can be huge. Uh, you can get sparks to emerge from the faces of a crystal illuminated in this fashion. You can get 10 kilovolts per millimeter uh, of this kind of field in lithium niobate. Okay, but we don't care about the uh, space charge field itself. We care about the index change, and that's going to depend on the electro-optic coefficient. If we put an electric field, a space charge field in this material, Given the electro-optic coefficient of the material, that gives us an index change, and the index change will saturate just like the space charge field does. So we have an expression for the refractive index change in saturation when you have an intensity that's high enough in your beam. The bigger this refractive index change is, the larger the distortions can be on your optical beam passing through here. And uh, these index changes can be quite large, as much as 10 to the minus 3, which is, as you know, a huge induced index change in a material. So the key parameter dictating is your material a good material or a bad material for photorefraction is this ratio of space of photogalvanic coefficient to the um, uh, photoconductivity. You might say, all right, uh, I've got these iron defects. They're causing trouble. Why don't I just try to make less a purer and purer crystal with less and less iron in it? Well. Unfortunately, in a, if both the photogalvanic current and the photocarriers that produce the uh, uh, photoconductivity are both a result of the iron in your crystal, then you're not going to change this ratio. You'll cut this guy by 10 and that guy by 10 if I cut the iron by 10, and I won't, you won't change what this saturated refractive index difference is. You just make it occur a little more slowly. So. Uh, so it's very hard to fix this by making a very pure crystal. There were many efforts to do that, and it was never successful. So what you can do is change this uh, photoconductivity coefficient, and that's actually what is being changed by putting um, magnesium oxide into lithium niobate or putting, uh, uh, making the crystal closer to stoichiometry. It turns out that you are increasing the carrier lifetime, so you have a higher uh, carrier concentration for a given generation rate, and so you have a higher photoconductivity for a given generation rate due to this iron. So the, the actual effect of putting in these dopants is to eliminate a class of uh, electron traps, which lower the carrier lifetime and lower the photoconductivity. And so by putting in magnesium or making these crystals stoichiometric, you can typically get 100 or 1,000-fold more photoconductivity, and that in turn reduces this saturated refractive index change, 
a thousandfold, and so it becomes much less, usually not a significant problem in these properly prepared crystals. Um, but I won't, I said a few things here about that, but I won't bother you with them. I'll just note that in these photorefractively damage resistant crystals, typically you no longer are limited by photorefractive damage in the, in, in the power handling ability of the crystal. You're usually limited by these simple thermal effects from the linear absorption causing refractive index changes. And 20 or 30 watts of visible light have been produced by SHG in these crystals that previously would damage at milliwatt or submilliwatt optical powers. So that was a successful piece of material engineering. Uh, one last point, uh, and this is an annoying one that we've just been bumping into lately. Uh, if you operate these crystals in the two photon absorption regime, uh, behaviors can be different than when they're operating in the one photon absorption regime. Um, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, if you're dealing with a semiconductor material like gallium arsenide, uh, it can often be the case that the photocarriers that uh, are generated and create a plasma, a, a plasma of electrons and holes, it's, this pla it's not so much the energy you have lost to the two photon absorption that makes your that causes trouble by temperature rise or something. It's the fact that when you make these carrier plasmas, you change the refractive index via the free carrier dispersion. Typically, you make a negative lens. It's a negative coefficient. And so your beam will blow up due to this induced refractive index change. And you can also get free carrier absorption. And the free carrier absorption by these two photon generated carriers can actually be much stronger than the original two-photon absorption itself. And so that's one family of things to be uh, concerned about. If you're using a gallium arsenide or orientation pattern gallium arsenide, for example, uh, it's, uh, even though its nominal transparency edge is about one micron or 900 nanometers, especially for pulsed applications, the crystal is almost useless until your wavelengths are exceed twice the band gap or about 1.7 microns. Uh, so that's one thing to be aware of. Another thing to be aware of is uh, we were talking about this photoconductivity and how the lifetime is altered in uh, uh, magnesium doped or um, stoichiometric lithium nivate, and that's how you reduce the photorefractive effect. So in other words, uh, you typically have some phenomenon like this where uh, in our photorefractive problem, we photoionize this deep level, maybe it's iron, make a photocarrier. Usually, the decay mechanism is falling into a shallow trap, probably an anti-site niobium, and then recombining back to its original uh, iron defect. This first process is what controls the lifetime that goes into the photoconductivity. OK, that's great. Um, uh, and we can get rid of this defect level here by stoichiometric preparation or magnesium oxide doping. In the two-photon regime, uh, the, the whole transport dynamics of the carriers is different. You don't have to involve any deep levels. You just make an electron hole pair by two-photon absorption. And the recombination is this electron hole pair recombining. And that's a very different set of time constants and behaviors than in the one photon case. And we have seen some unfortunate uh, evidence that magnesium doped lithium nibate, while it's almost immune to one photon photorefractive damage, can in fact show significant photorefractive damage when you're illuminating it with intense enough radiation to cause two photon absorption. So uh, nothing is ever perfect. Um, OK. Uh, let's not get into that since we're out of time. Uh, one last thing, if you happen to be working with periodically polled lithium niobate, especially magnesium doped lithium niobate, we said we made this great high photoconductivity crystal. It's very resistant to photorefractive damage. Okay, so we built a monolithic OPO with a periodically polled section going down it, and we said, well, this thing should work great because it's a low loss crystal, there's no uh, 
uh, transmission through any interfaces. This should be a very low threshold OPO. And uh, what we saw was we, it was very unstable. It was very hard to operate. It had a high threshold. It was a mess. When we temperature tuned it, all sorts of misbehaviors occurred. And uh, we didn't quite understand that. Uh, we did an experiment then where we took a magnesium doped lithium niobate crystal, illuminated it with a visible laser, and put it in a little temperature controlled oven and ramped the temperature up and down. So uh, it's a damage resistant crystal. When this temperature was not being changed, we had a nice optical beam going through the crystal. When we tuned the temperature, this is what the output of the crystal looked like. It was a standard photorefractive mess. Uh, if you let the temperature settle for a while, the beam would kind of clean itself up. So uh, what happened here? Uh, what happened was um, when you change the temperature, you may or may not be aware of it, but pyroelectric effects mean you build an electric field across the crystal in proportional to temperature changes. That's how you make a pyroelectric detector. When you put a field across the crystal, if it has high photoconductivity, the field, uh, sorry, to put a potential across the crystal, uh, which you do by ramping the temperature, in the highly photoconductive illuminated regions, you screen out that field, so you have a spatially and homogeneous field again. Now the photorefract, sorry, the pho pyroelectric field is screened by the photoconductivity that you just carefully engineered into your crystal to avoid the photovoltaic damage. But now you've made a crystal that's very sensitive to pyroelectric damage because it will very efficiently screen out the pyroelectric field that appears across the crystal. Well, the solution in that case is periodically pull the whole path of your crystal. We specifically didn't periodically pull the paths that weren't involved in the interaction. If you periodically pull it, you flip the sign of the electro-optic coefficient, and so this damage changes sign every few microns, and the average damage is much less. So, we built a second one of these devices where we pulled it everywhere, and the problem went away. So keep that in mind if you're ever doing this kind of experiment with lithium nibate, you plan to temperature tune it, have all the beam paths uh, in a periodically pulled region, even if they don't need to be for, uh, 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 second, uh, for nonlinear phase matching purposes. OK, um, like I said, it's very idiosyncratic, this world. Uh, there's no one hour or 10 hour lecture where you could talk about all the problems. Um, but let me just close by saying there are new materials emerging that are significantly improving the situation with respect to both intrinsic uh, misbehaviors, the gallium arsenide with its deep infrared transmission compared to the oxide materials, LBGO, this borate ferroelectric, fixing the intrinsic problems as you go off to short wavelengths as well as improved ferroelectrics, stoichiometric crystals of lithium nibate and tantalate, magnesium doped crystals of lithium and nibate and tantalate, improved compositions of KTP, as well as other arsenate and phosphate family uh, crystals with resistance to gray track damage, and uh, waveguide technologies with undoped core regions mechanically created which are also quite photorefractively damage resistant compared to conventional diffused waveguides in lithium ibate. There are a family of solutions emerging for these problems, but you do need to think about the large family of bad behavior that can bother your, your experiments in order to design a good, uh, a good scheme. So most nonlinear interactions will sooner or later be pushed to their material limit. Uh, some understanding of the underlying mechanisms. mechanisms are useful if you want to discuss problems intelligently with your material vendors or design your apparatus or your architecture of your device to minimize the impact. And if you're not in a big rush, you can even try to improve your materials by finding ways to eliminate some of the defects that bother uh, your application. So thanks for your attention.